morning, everyone. There's a wonderful scene in the scriptures. It's recorded twice. And it's uh, in the book of Revelation. It's the heavenly throne of God. And before the heavenly throne of God, there is the representative, I believe, of the church. And we're standing before the throne of God. And we have crowns upon our heads. And we will take those crowns off and we will cast them before his holiness, before his presence, you know. And I think it's in that moment, well, this is just me, I think it's in that moment, I think we're going to realize that there is God and there is everything else. God alone is holy. And there is a sense there when we take those crowns off of our heads, which represents the victory of Christ. They're the victor's crown, which repre represents the victory of Christ uh, that, has, that, has, that has brought us into the presence of God. Without it, we're not there, are we? Without it, we can't stand before Him. But there will be a moment, and I believe it, there will be a real practical moment when we will stand there and we will take those crowns from our head and we will cast them before His presence, acknowledging that He alone is holy. You know, we have been called to be holy even as He is holy. The Scriptures tell us that. But your holiness is only a reflection of His work in you and through you to this world around us. There is God and there is everything else. And God has saved us. He's cleansed us. He looks upon us as righteous, set us apart for heaven. And we are here. And God is up there somewhere, right? And in this life, as we submit ourselves to him, as we seek him and honor him with all that we do and everywhere that we go, every thought, word and deed is unto our Lord Jesus Christ. Daily we've been conformed, transformed into the image, the image that we are to be. And I think there's something special about that moment. And... Uh, Prepare yourself. It's going to fit well upon your head. It's going to be very comfortable. But there's going to be a moment when there needs to be an acknowledgement that it's his righteousness, it's his holiness. And he alone is worthy of all praise, glory and honour. Amen? Amen. Mm, yes. Wonderful to see you. Welcome, visitors. Um, um, if you're a visitor this morning, you've walked into... Well, let me pause for a moment before I get there. A um, couple of introductions. First introduction this morning is to a little boy by the name of Elijah. Is he in the room? He's not in the room, is he? All right. So Elijah, um, Caitlin and Casey's second child is here at church today. I think it's the first time he's been at church. So... It is, yeah. So I know some of you have met Elijah, but please, please take the, take the opportunity to, um, to um, let him know you're here and let him know that you know that he is here. Did that make sense? All right. And there is another introduction, two new people that are in the church today. I say welcome visitors, but there are two new people in the church today, and I say this confidently. You might look at them and think, no, no, they've been here for a long time. No, they haven't. There are two new people here today. Would you stand, please? Bronwyn and Johan. Yeah. And as they and as they stand before you, I've got this this is one of my privileges, right? This is one of my privileges. I would like to present to you for the very first, no, for the second time, but it is the very first time here in our midst, Mr. and Mrs. Johan and Bronwyn Becker. Here they are. So you've never seen this couple before as husband and wife. You knew them as two separate individuals, but now they are one in front. Yeah. <laughs> so do take the opportunity to congratulate them. Well done, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure I've missed things. But welcome this morning. Um, I better keep moving. We, um, if you're again visitors, welcome. Um, 
if you're here today for the first time, we are in the book of Ephesians, and we are in the midst of, a, of the passages, the marriage passages, in Ephesians chapter 5. And so we are um, there, so uh, welcome to that this morning. And if you're a husband, you'll be even more grateful for being here, I'm sure. Um, no, we will, we will. Um, so let me just begin. The last two Sundays we were together, um, where we're looking at how Scripture lays out, as I've said, God's divine order within the marriage relationship. Um, and the importance... Well, the importance, I must say, or well, the crucial understanding is that the Bible never promotes this thing we call marriage, this marriage relationship between a husband and a wife as based upon superiority of one over another. You know, I know it's often interpreted that way, and we've talked about that for a couple of weeks now, but rather it emphasises the individual roles that we each have towards one another and that those roles function within a mutual love, respect and partnership that we have in the goal of, of, of living life together as husband and wife and that those roles or those functions if you want to call them with this mutual love, this mutual respect, uh, uh, should be the underpinning foundation as we seek to reflect the beauty of Christ's love for his church to the world, to, to the, his love for the church to the world around us. And so, and so husbands are encouraged to lead their families with that same selfless, Love and devotion that Christ has demonstrated towards the church. We'll read those verses in a moment. Likewise, wives are called to submit to their husbands in a spirit of mutual respect and cooperation. We've spent about two weeks talking about that. And so we read, this is what we read, if, if you have not been with us. Verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So last time we talked about the wife's vital role as her husband's helpmate, as mentioned to us in the creation story in the book of Genesis. She supports her husband. She helps her husband. She influences her husband, but he leads, but he leads. Um, I, I remember, this story just jumped into my head. I remember um, many years ago, um, we were in a shopping center and um, I was wearing my favorite T-shirt at the time. It, it, it was, um, who remembers the Coke? The Coke, um, there was the Coke advertising campaign. Um, so Coke, Coke is the real thing. Remember that? Are you old enough to remember that, anybody? Well, it was my favourite T-shirt. I wore it everywhere, and 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 I remember being. We were in a supermarket. Um, we were in Mandurah. We were in a supermarket. I remember where. I remember when, because it impacted me. This is this is my wife. Supporting her husband, my wife helping her husband, her, my wife influencing her husband. The kids weren't behaving. There's one of them there. He's got his own kids now. Um, the kids weren't behaving and we're in the shopping centre there and I, I was less than I should have been. Right? And, I just rem and, and it was just this moment and Donna just turned to me and looked at me and said... Watch what you say when you're wearing that. That's all it was. Watch what you say when you're wearing that. The shirt that said, Christ is the real thing, not Coke is the real thing. And um, 
Never forgot it. I continue to wear that shirt. But it was the things that Donna said that day that really impacted me. Because she was a woman who supported her husband, who helped her husband, that influenced her husband. And, and, but she, allowed her hus she allows her husband to lead. Right? Doesn't mean she doesn't... She doesn't mean she, that we don't talk about things. It doesn't mean that we don't both contribute to things. But submission, and this is what we've looked at again. I'm sorry I've got rushing through this. Uh, uh, as we've looked at over the last two weeks, means that she looks to her husband to lead their family. And again, as I said last time, over the past 40 years now, um, Donna has been a constant presence of support and wisdom, she helps me to lead in a godly way. She's always influencing me to be a better husband, a better father, a better Christian, a better pastor. That's why God said it's not good that man should be alone. It's not good that for us to be alone, man. We can't do this ourselves. And there is a helpmate that has been provided for us and again, we looked at that last time, so I won't labour the point. By God's design, I'm, I'm just saying to you, I believe that I'm a better person or I am better for us because she is who she is. I know it, and I know Donna knows it. We both know that God has brought us together and given us different roles, given us different functions, all designed to work together harmoniously as a reflection, as I said a moment ago, of God's heart towards his people. So, this is where we're at. Well, verse 23, we read this last time. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. So, so here the husband's authority is in marriage is likened to Christ's authority over his church, and that it is qualified by the statement that he is the saviour of the body. So, so what does it mean to be head of the wife? Well, as Christ is head of the church and saviour of the body, well, how, do, how, does that, how, does, how is that shown to us in the scripture? It's shown to us, well, Christ loved the church and he gave his life for the church, right? So he is the saviour. And similarly, husbands, and this is where we're going this morning, similarly, husbands are to love their wives and be willing to give up their lives for their wives. And that's verse 25. That's where we're at. Well, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So in a nutshell, it means just as Jesus took responsibility for us through self-sacrifice, he sacrificed himself. Just as Jesus took responsibility, so too does a husband take responsibility for his wife through self-sacrifice. Christ provides guidance and support and love to the body of believers. And likewise, we husbands are encouraged to provide leadership, love and support to our wife for the sake of our family. His role, husband, your role, is to model to everybody else. A husband, he speaks wisdom, he prays through issues, and then he gently instructs the rest of the family in the way that they should go. This is the example that Christ has given. And I know last time I said to you, remember I said to you, husbands, in, in advance we need to apologise to our wives? Because, you know, we should apologise at the altar, I think, because I know we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. I know this is a work of God's spirit within our lives. But it is the ideal... It is what God would have us to be working towards in our lives for the sake of our, our marriage, our wives and our families again. 
Because you, husband, are responsible before God for the spiritual and emotional well-being of every body within your family. He is to be Christ-like. Um, every father... Well, I can't say that, but I will. Every father who walks his daughter down the aisle and hands her over to her prospective husband is doing so with firm intention. And the firm intention is this. There's great symbolism in that, isn't there? Great symbolism. Just... Uh, just as he has been responsible for, for providing for his daughter in every way, been responsible to provide for her emotionally, pra practically, physically, spiritually, most certainly, he is now walking her down the aisle and he is about to hand her over to another man. And when he does that, we do this with ceremony, because when he does that, he is saying to this young man, Yes, I accept you, but I am passing on to you the greatness of the responsibility that I have undertaken since that child was given to me as a gift, however many years ago it was. I have taken upon myself as her father to love her and to care for her and to nourish her and to provide for her, again, emotionally, practically and spiritually. And, and young man, I am giving her to you for that purpose. It's awesome, isn't it? It really is. For that purpose. And that man is what it is to be a head. To be a head. That's how God designed his family. He knows how best it functions. And when we apply these standards of, of love and submission and responsibility and sacrificial servant hearts as in leadership, that, that's when families thrive. That's why these passages are so important to us. And when a husband steps up, and assumes the responsibility that God has placed upon him, guess what happens? The rest of the family finds it much easier to fulfill their own roles in God's design. And so husbands, welcome to church this morning. We have to step up, right? I charge... Every husband, um, at every wedding ceremony that I do, Johan has heard this, and Bronwyn has heard me ask her husband this. I charge every husband at every wedding service that I do and remind the husband that God is giving him the responsibility to be the initiator of love in this relationship. And I say to him, your example is Christ, to be the initiator of love in this relationship. So husbands, in honouring your responsibility, do you know in the scriptures we are told that uh, we are to love our wives, right? And the word that is always used is the word agape. It's that self-sacrificial love, that love of God that expects nothing in return. It's self-sacrificial love. Husbands, do you know there's nowhere in the, in the scriptures that tell wives to love their husbands sacrificially? There is one verse, and it doesn't use the word agape, it uses the words phileo, which is to, 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 be, is to be a friend, a support, a, to be that nurturing person with them. But when it comes to the initiator of love, and this is what I say to the husbands, God will never ever give you an example not to be actively, sacrificially loving your wife. Never. He never gives you an excuse to do that. Welcome to church, husbands. Um, 
we have a responsibility on. Think about this. Think about this. In honouring our responsibility as heads in a marriage, we must contemplate the enormity of Christ's sacrificial love. We must think about it. In giving his life on the cross, Jesus was demonstrating a love that transcends, transcends our comprehension. It really does. It was a love that is not based on merit. There is absolutely nothing about the sacrificial love of God and what Christ has, has obtained for us through the death of his son upon the cross. There is nothing about it that we have earned. It is all by the unmerited grace of God. It's all his gift, isn't it? And when, as a, as a husband, I have to look at my wife, I have to look at those responsibilities, I have to recognise who Christ is and what he has done for us, and I have to realise that that love, that sacrificial love, was motivated by his profound desire for the well-being and the redemption of his beloved, and that is his bride. And your divine direction, if you will, or directive, is to mirror that sacrificial love. As husbands, we are called to love, or to a love that goes beyond emotions, it goes beyond, goes beyond conveniences. It's a love that actively seeks to see your wife flourishing even if it requires and when, and it does require, your personal sacrifice. And for the unmarried girl, just quickly, this is all I've got to say to you today. For the unmarried girl, lady, young lady, sorry, that love is not found on a, on, on a reality TV show. It's not found in a pub or in a nightclub. That love is only found one place on the face of this earth. It's not found in many, in many of the religious systems of the, any of the, many of the religious systems in this world, in many of the cultures of this world, where women are placed in a subservient position to their husbands. It's not placed in any of those places. The only place that that is found is within the heart of a spirit-filled man of God. It's the only place. And it's the only place we should look. You should look, ladies. So, I'm speaking to husbands, aren't I? And you are now sitting there and you are with eager anticipation, right? Saying, well, what does this look like? And I'm really glad you asked that question. Because sacrificial love, here we go. It will recognise, and this is by no way, no way, by no way, um, a description. It is a description. No, it's not even a description. I don't know what it is. Listen to this. Sacrificial love will prioritise the needs and desires of your wife over your own. Number one. Isn't that what Christ has done? He will prioritise the needs of your wife over your own. Um, and, and not just, and not just in that, you know, that, that flurry of emotion when we first start out in this relationship. When we look at one another and we cannot see anything wrong within the other person's life. Everything about them is just wonderful. Everything they do. Every little thing that comes from them and, and, ex and is expressed by them is just perfect. Why? Because we're deeply in love, you know. And even those weird little noises they make when they eat and all that sort of stuff. I just love what you do. It's just wonderful, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that at all, right? I'm talking about life. I'm talking about an attitude towards the one that God has brought to you, husband has brought to you as his gift to you to be your helpmate. You are to actively to seek 
her or your wife's flourishing, even if it requires your own personal sacrifice. You are to prioritise her needs, as I've said, and her desires over your own. And that means that we are going to be actively, we're going to be willingly setting aside our own personal interests throughout our lives. Throughout our lives, right? And love's going to be the motivation. Husband, if you hear those words, if you hear those words that say, hey, we always do what you want. Have you heard those words? If you hear those words, we are always doing what you want, then it's time to stop and it's time to t- take stock. And let me tell you, it's far deeper than, hey, just the movie that we watch on movie night or whatever it is that we have. And it's far deeper than, hey, the beach that we go to when we go to the beach. No, no, no. No, it's time to genuinely invest in her. It, it's, it's time to genuinely spend quality time with her. We've heard all these things before, right? But it's to engage with her. It, it, it means listening. Again, we know these things, but it means a genuine effort to understand her thoughts, her feelings, her concerns, the things that are going on in this person who we are laying our life down for. It means being a source of strength. It means being her comfort. It means offering encouragement. It means understanding. It's all of these things you know here. But it's allowing those to become the practical expression of your heart towards this other person who takes the paramount position in your life. There is no other being on this planet more important than this person. That's that's it, isn't it? Isn't that how Christ looked at you? As you you individually, he willingly died for you individually. Individually. Hmm. It means sincerely apologising. You know that? It means seeking forgiveness when needed. Sacrificial love always shows great humility and a willingness to admit when you are wrong, right? But the belligerent, and this is where we men so often find ourselves, the belligerent-minded person who can't apologise and can't admit they are wrong because they have to win. They have to be right. Because after all, they're the head, aren't they? What's in the head? The brain. We're the ones who've got the brain, right? Look, we may never say that to our wives. You're a brave man if you do. You're a foolish man if you do. (laughs) But there is a belligerence that creeps into many men, right? Many men, because we don't want to be wrong, you know? That person, that husband, please hear this, can never give his wife the security of knowing that she is in a safe, secure and honest relationship. You see, that marriage is always going to feel like a state of war. But again, the husband who is willing to humble himself, the husband who's willing to be transparent with his wife, the husband, that husband is what they are doing is that they are fostering a healthy, honest relationship. And such husbands, let me tell you, they rejoice in every success of their wife. They rejoice in the successes of their wife. You know, they have set aside any sense of competition and we're we're liars if we say it's not there within our homes. Husbands, we are to set that competition aside. We are to set any seed of jealousy aside that is welling up within our hearts towards the most important person that is upon this planet. We put those things aside and genuinely celebrate their achievements. He, you husband, are her biggest fan. And he, you, will sacrifice all for the well-being and the happiness of his wife. 
He will serve her. He will honour her. He will celebrate her. He will pray for her. He will pray with her. And he will see God's guiding and blessing for her. You see, sacrificial love, I know I've said it, it goes beyond mere sentiment. It, it requires intentional and selfless actions that daily contribute to the well-being and the flourishing of your wife. It's the words you say. It's not just the words you say, it's the way you say them. Donna gets me on that one every, almost every time. No, it's not every day, is it? <coughs> but it is. It's the words you say, it's the way you say them, it's the things you do, it's the time you spend, it's where you spend that time, it's the places you go, it's the things you buy, it's the money you spend, it's the goals that you have set, right? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ has also loved the church and given himself for her. As Christ gave himself for his church, you husbands have to realise that, well, did you hear what the verse said? I'm going to read it again. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. And what did he do? He gave himself for her. As Christ gave himself for his church, husbands have to realise that that is what your wife really wants. She wants you, husband. She wants you. And I know some of you may even be sitting there saying, but I, I do, I do it all, right? Right? I take care of everything. I provide for everything. I work so very hard at it. I fix everything. I'm there to do everything. But so often that's our problem, men. That, that's our problem. We are so focused on everything. And when, and when we've taken care of everything, what do we do? We take a well-deserved break and we reward ourselves because we've done absolutely everything and so often our wives are sitting there looking around at everything and they're thinking, I just want you. I just want you. Look, years ago, Donna and I, well, actually, let me say, years ago, Donna taught me a lesson. Um, there have been many. Thank you. And I, I, I don't remember what the issue was or even what was going on and I may not get through this story very well because this changed my life I, I don't necessarily I've just set myself up to fail terribly haven't I, I, I I'm going to say it again I don't know what the issue was I don't know what was going on but Donna was troubled and I was confused and I was frustrated and there was something that was wrong I just didn't know how to fix it. In fact, I didn't even really know what it was. And I'm trying to fix something that I don't really know what it is. And I remember in the midst of this struggle, I can still see it now, in the midst of this struggle, of a real struggle, we were standing together, we were embracing one another, and I remember she leant in and she said to me, I don't need you to fix it. This is hard. I don't need you to fix it. All I need to hear you say is, it's going to be okay. Just tell me we're going to be okay. <laughs> Changed my life. We're going to be okay. And you know, a light bulb went on in my head. You know? Because what she actually was saying was this. I, I just need to know that you're here. I just need to know it. And to this day, we both say it. 
all the time. We both say it. We, we use different words all the time. But, you know, it's, it's, we say, it's going to be okay. It's, I'm all right. I'm okay. This is our language. I'm all right. I'm okay. It always works out, you know. It's not always the same words, but it's always saying the same thing. I just need to know that you are here. That you are really, really here. I need to know that if everything is gone, we are still here. We're still standing. You've got to sow that into your marriage every single day of your life. That's permanence. You've got to sow those seeds of permanence into your life every single day, into your marriage. There are four principles that I like to share with young people. There's a principle of severance, there's a principle of permanence, there's a principle of acceptance, and there's a principle of intimacy. And intimacy is always the goal, right? right. Severance is this is recognising that there is a supreme relationship, which is God, right? that we are both dependent upon. But severance is also recognising that there is a supreme relationship in this world with human beings. And we have to be on guard all the time, husbands especially, of any other relationship that's going to seek to get into the way, that's going to interfere in the primary relationship that we have with our beloved. Because Satan hates marriage. He hates a happy marriage. You know why he hates a happy marriage? Because a happy marriage is designed to reflect God's love for his church. And the tragedy is, is that 50% of everybody that says, I do, at the altar, doesn't make it. So every single day, you've got to be on guard, husbands especially, to make sure you do not allow any other relationship to get in the way. There needs to be severance. Things need to be cut off. And we watch, and you watch, there are things that are always trying to creep in, trying to separate you from your beloved. But here's the thing. Those four principles, to, they're pillars that hold up. You know, we, you know, what does the Bible tell us? Unless the Lord builds the house, he labors in, unless, unless the Lord builds your house, the, la the laborer labors in vain, Right? And there are four pillars. Severance. If severance isn't happening, then you are never going to know permanence. I'll tell you, husband, if you are not maintaining your wife as that supreme relationship in this world, then she is always going to be wondering about what's really the most important thing to you. And if you don't have severance, that pillar of severance holding up your, your life, your marriage, then you don't have permanence. And if you don't have permanence, and you've got to sow those seeds of permanence into your relationship every single day, it's the things, I've said it already, it's the things we say, it's the things we do, it's the places we go, it's where we invest ourselves. Permanence says, I am here, and you are here, and we will always be here. If the world should fall, if the sky comes down, we will be here. That's permanence. You sow those seeds of permanence because if you don't sow seeds of permanence into your marriage, you will never, your wife will never have an understanding or really a sense of true acceptance. You can't accept someone completely if you don't know that they're always going to be there. You see how the enemy wants to get in? And where there is severance and where there is permanence and where there is acceptance there is the most beautiful intimacy in a relationship beautiful intimacy where nothing is hidden there's transparency there's one person on this planet who you don't have to hide 
anything from. There's one person on this planet where you can be absolutely, absolutely open and honest about who you are and how you feel of everything. And that person will never, ever, ever betray you. You've got to know that about one another. Shall I give them the key? Shall I give them the key? The key is this. The key is this. It's what you know about the other person. It's that you know that this person will never do willingly or purposefully anything to harm you. You know that about this person. And you both know it about one another. And you know it, but you know it. And the reality is this. You know that you will hurt one another. You know you're going to offend one another. Because you're not perfect. There's only one who is holy, and that is God. That's not you, right? You know you're going to fail. You know you're going to stumble. You know you will hurt each other. But if you hold this key, if you hold this key in your heart towards each other, and husbands... Oh, husbands, if you know it, let's, let's be honest. I'm, I'm digressing all over the place today, I'm sorry, but let's be honest. Who has spent a day not talking to your beloved? All right, no one, obviously. Who has spent half an hour not talking to your beloved because they've offended you or hurt you? Nobody in this room? <laughs> well, it's uh, a morning. Didn't look at each other in the morning, for a whole morning. All right, let's do a day. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> Who went to bed and got up the next morning and just still didn't want to look at her? Yeah. All right. We're getting honest now. We're getting transparent. This is good. This is great. What a waste of time. What an absolute waste of your life. What an absolute waste of your marriage. You see, if you hold this key within your heart about this person that God has brought to you, if you know that this person would never intentionally seek to harm me, you know what you can do? Can I, can I tell you about... Can I tell you about... An, one, two, two hours that I wasted just recently. Donna and I, sorry, love. <laughs> Donna and I, can't remember what it was, something happened. I said something, Donna said something. You know where I was going when Donna said her something? I was walking out the door to come here to do a midweek Bible study. Right? And I sat in the car and I said, thanks very much. You know? Because I just I walked out. I said, thanks very much. And I came and I sat down here and I faked it. You know? I did this Bible study and then I left and I went home. And as I was driving home, God was so heavy on my heart. He was beating me about the place. He really was. Who do you think you are? You say these things, you tell people these things, and yet you walk out of the house and you leave her like that? And by the time I got home, I had shed a bucket full of tears I'd torn, my, I'd, I'd torn myself apart and I walked into the and I, and, I, and I walked into the house. Donna was just getting ready to go to bed and she was very sheepishly standing there and I walked up to her and I threw my arms around her and I said, love, I'm sorry, I didn't listen. If I had done that two hours ago, because I know she doesn't want to hurt me and she knows I don't want to hurt her. If I'd have done that two hours ago, I don't know. 
We waste so many years, don't we? So many years. End of the day, husbands, we are called to love our wives as Christ has loved the church and given himself for her. And I'm... Can I give you one more point? Are you still here with me? Are you still here? Yes. I, I promise not to digress anymore. But I am such a failure, you know? And I've got so many stories to tell. <laughs> but God is so gracious. And he's been doing wonderful things in my life, in our life, in our marriage. And we are so blessed, Amen. you know? But I've got to be real. We've got to be real with each other. If we, men, if we as godly men are giving ourselves to our wives, we should have a sanctifying influence in their life. Because that's what Paul says next, right? Quickly, let, me, let me quickly read this and I'm going to wrap this up. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her. Hear that? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Again, when couples come to me to be married, one of the pictures that I give to the groom in particular is that, uh, is that of a beautiful, a beautiful vase that has been given to them as a gift. And I ask them, if they are given this beautiful vase, this beautiful gift, what do they do with something that is so beautiful? And the answer, of course, is to take that beautiful vase and to place it in the most prominent place in your house so that everybody can see it and see it for all its beauty. All its beauty, right? But like so many precious items, as time goes by, that vase gets neglected, even replaced by newer things. And while it still stays in that prominent place up there, in its position on the mantel place, so often it gets pushed back, doesn't it? It gets pushed back behind other things. It gets shoved aside and other things become the centre of attention while this once cherished vase is now gathering dust out of sight. What does the vase, of course, represent? It represents a neglected wife. A neglected wife. I was listening to a commentator on this passage and he tells the story of a little boy who finds a picture of his mum before she got married to his dad and she looks at this picture and she sees he goes my what a pretty lady and he takes it to his his dad and says dad who is this woman who is this pretty woman in this picture and he says why son that's your mum before we got before we got married that's your mum when she was young and the boy's response was that's mum that's mum was that mum before she came to work for us? No. Oh. Oh, yes. See, the picture that is given here in Ephesians is that Christ's love is not passive, but rather it is active. It's a love that pursues or purifies, I should say, and sanctifies. It's a love that beautifies the soul of your wife. And the washing of the water, as we read there, symbolises the cleansing power of God's work. It's an expression of God's love actively working to cleanse us and to purify us. It is a transformative work that continues always. It is a constant source that is shaping us into the image of Jesus Christ. And as we engage with the scripture, you know this. You get told this all the time in this church. As we engage within the scripture individually and of course corporately when we gather together in this place, what does the word of God do? It renews our minds. It brings about a continual transformation that is taking place. Husbands, we are asked a question here. We're asked a very important question here. Are we actively feeding our wives' soul with the word of God? 
Are we leading her into a deeper understanding and application of biblical truth throughout our lives and our experiences? Are we guiding our wives through the challenges of this life that we are doing together, we're going through together? Are we got, and, and we are drawing, are we drawing upon the wisdom of the foundation that is given us by the scriptures? Are we going to the Word of God when there are questions, when there are struggles? And just importantly, are our actions, and I know I've said this all over this morning, but are our actions, our attitudes, and the way we treat our wives reflecting the teachings of Christ? Are we setting that example of humility and forgiveness and love within our marriage has the word of God, or is the word of God, now let me say this, has the word of God set you, husband, apart first? Right? That's the first question, isn't it, really? Are we ourselves sanctified, set apart by the word of God? Are we men of the word? For without the word, we cannot be the priest within our home. We cannot be. We cannot be the spiritual pillars upholding and sanctifying the truth of God's word for the hearts of those that are important to us. We cannot be that, right? So the question I must answer this is a hard question to ask husband but I have to ask him is your wife more like Christ because she's married to you? That's the question. The question is, where have you brought her? He said, I brought her to church. That's not the question. Where have you brought her? Have you led her anywhere at all? Or have you just simply abrogated your responsibility as a husband to lead her towards Christ? Today, I just want to say this. Husbands, this day, today, you have, will have opportunities to lead your wife towards Christ. You're going to have opportunities to wash her in the Word of God as the experiences of life. You are probably going to have those opportunities on the way home. Because I think some of you may not be talking the way you were talking when you came here. Some of you may be challenged. Some of you may walk out of here and go, heard it all before. Some of you might say, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, fine. But today you have opportunities to wash your wife in the word of God and to lead her towards Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your wonderful gift to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the great privilege that we have as sons and daughters of God to be able to gather in a place like this amongst people like this who with like-minded hearts are so aware of the price that has been paid, the sacrifice that has taken place, that we might know you Father, I do pray for our marriages. And Lord, I do pray that you would help us all to be both better wives and better husbands. Lord, may we truly know within our hearts as wives that you led me to this man. And as husbands, know in our hearts that, God, you brought this woman to me. That we might become the very best that you created us to be. Help us in these things, Father. Lord, help us to stand firmly upon the solid rock foundation that is Christ Jesus and allow his word to speak to us and guide us. 
Lord, if we're in this place and our marriage is struggling, I thank you, Father, that you are a forgiving and a healing God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would soften hardened hearts. Lord, you would open the doors of opportunity for us to be able to simply look into one another's face and say, I'm here. And I need you. Father, I, I pray you would, Lord, build, yes, your church, but within your church, this foundational building block of a marriage that we know our society stands upon. And we cherish it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray that you would bless our marriages. Amen. Amen.